So, welcome everyone. Um, we're gonna just give it one more minute just to see, I see people are still coming in. So we'll just give it another couple seconds or to a minute and as people still join. So let's just sure. Let's so we're going to get started. Um, all right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We're very excited today to um, kick off the 2020 National Sick American Findings. Um, today we have some very special guests. Um, let me introduce everyone who's here with us. So today I'm going to actually let you. Let's move this into, uh, so we can show everybody. We're gonna do gallery view. Um, so today we have with us Kieran Corgill, SALDEF Executive Director. Uh, we also are really excited to have Senator Monka Dingra with us from Washington State. Um, and then we will all, we also have um, Kavneet Singh, who is SALDEF board chair, and Aman Singh Sarah, who is SALDEF board member. So what I'm going to have, um, I'm going to send it over to Kieran, and she can introduce SALDEF. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Kavneet. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, I also uh, specifically want to thank uh, the SICK community for your support of this survey. We are so excited to release the findings of the 2020 National SICK Survey. Um, as many of you know, SALDEF is the oldest SICK American advocacy organization. We are a national SICK American organization um, founded in 1996. Um, so we're almost at our 25th anniversary coming up this, uh, this coming year in 2021. Our focus is on media, policy, and education, and our mission is to empower sick Americans by building dialogue, deepening understanding, encouraging civic and political participation, and upholding civil rights and religious freedoms for all Americans. Again, very excited uh, for, to have all of you with us here today, and I'm going to pass it over to our board chair, Kavneet Singh, who will be talking a little bit more about the 2020 National Sick Survey. Kavneet. Thanks so much, Karen. Gujri, thank you. Um, and thank you for joining us. And of course, Senator Dingra, pleasure. Um, over 30 years, I think, of friendship and that we've known each other. Thank you for being here with us. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's my privilege and honor to be here today representing the organization. Um, as Karen mentioned, my name is Kavneet Singh. I am the board chair of the Sick American Legal Defense and Education Fund. Thank you for joining us today on this really historic day to release the first ever National Sick American Survey. This is the first of its kind survey, which endeavors to tell the story of the sick American community and provide a demographic snapshot. With the 2020 election around the corner, we felt it was critical for us to find and identify the needs of the community, as well as what are their current thoughts on a variety of issues. Often the voice of sick Americans is not heard, by policymakers, law enforcement officials, elected officials, government, local and federal government agencies, and the mainstream media, due in part to this general lack of awareness, education, and understanding of the community. To address the lack of information on the experiences, perspectives, and advocacy needs of sick Americans, we launched this survey to provide a multi of interested parties the means to better understand and assess the unique needs and perspectives of our community. The SALDEF research team developed a survey of nearly 50 questions across eight topics, including demographics, six in the workplace and in schools, cultural connection, political engagement, <clears throat> use and perception of the news, access to resources, discrimination, 
and awareness. Survey was open to all six over the age of 13, currently live in the United States. Uh, we used the SurveyMonkey platform, which was open for 27 days and had a final response of over 1,800 responses. Um, it, our first humble attempt, really, at being able to understand what are the needs of the community, how can we begin to leverage the interests, the beliefs, and the political dynamic that the community has to begin to affect change. If anything, we've seen this election is very much about showing up and very much about making sure that your voice is heard. And this is our humble attempt to start that for the community. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, I'm honored to be here with my colleagues here. And um, with that, I'd like to introduce Saldef's Vice Chair, Aman Singh Sira, to share some high level results of the survey. Thank you. Thank you, Kavneet, for that introduction. Again, I'm Amin Sira. I'm the Vice Chair of the Board here at SALDEF. Um, and I'm going to be just going over a little bit of the uh, some of the key findings that we have from the survey. And uh, Kudri, if it's possible, would you be able to share pages uh, 10 and 11 of the uh, actual survey? All right. And uh, as we're, we're getting that up, I uh, just wanted to let you know that SALDEF developed this survey um, along with a five-person research team that was led by a research coordinator, Rebecca Glynn, who specializes in survey design and is a graduate of the Edward Blaustein School of Planning and Public Policy. She was supported by four sick lead interns who have experience in data collection and data analysis. Um, and the survey was developed in essentially three stages that were repeated multiple times. The first part was research and question development. Um, they researched uh, a lot of previously done re um, surveys, uh, including from the Pew Research Center, uh, Monmouth University Polling Institute, and Public uh, Religion Research Institute. Uh, they developed their own questions. And then the, the next step was to go through a cognitive interviewing cycle, where they interviewed literally dozens of people to get a better understanding of if the questions were targeting the issues that they wanted to address, uh, whether the questions were developed in a way that's easy for people of all levels to understand clearly. And then uh, after that, it went through an expert review where we got leaders um, and experts uh, related to the advocacy organizations here in the United States on sick Americans to review these questions, make sure they're, they're actually hitting on the topics that we're looking to address. And then we went through this entire cycle multiple times. So we went back to question development once we got the input from the cognitive interviewing and as well as the expert review. Um, and typically, this is slightly different than traditional survey development because we're unable to do um, focus groups due to COVID. So uh, they had the unique challenges of developing the survey within the pandemic um, atmosphere as well. So with that, I want to kind of go over a few of the key findings. This is a uh, very high level and just a few of them that we feel um, captured a lot of the information that we thought was going to be very interesting for you. And again, that report will have a list of a bunch of key findings as well as uh, more descriptive findings for you guys to peruse through. Um, with that, uh, can we uh, go over to page 22 and 23? So as you can see here, we have a whole bunch of different charts and graphs that show a lot of the survey results. Uh, particularly on here, we're going to be talking about political engagement. Uh, this whole section of the survey was actually supported by an additional three sick lead interns who focused purely on political engagement and helped develop some of those questions in addition to the original five person team. Uh, but just as you can see, I know with the election coming up next week, uh, a lot of people are interested in the data associated with that. Uh, and what you can see here is that 93% of all adult citizen respondents reported that they were registered to vote. And 89% of those respondents said that they voted in 2016, compared to 96% who plan to vote this year, uh, next week in the 2020 election. Um, so you can, you can see that we have a pretty high level of engagement when it comes to the sick American population. Also, another thing I want to point out was uh, political viewpoints. Uh, if you take a look, we had 52.3% of respondents say that they were liberal or very liberal. 40.2% say that they're moderate, and 7.4% say that they are conservative or very conservative. Um, and in terms of what party they identify with, 
61.7% identify with the Democratic Party, while 7.4% identify with the Republican Party. The remainder uh, is either independent, uh, another, a different um, political party, or unsure. Um, could we move over to page 24 and 25 next? All right, and as you can see here, uh, I think this is another one that's really interesting, uh, particularly as we come on uh, with the election day coming up next week. But we did a ranking of the most important topics um, or policy issues by level of importance. And as you can see, 71% uh, of respondents ranked racial justice as their top choice, and 69% ranked healthcare in their top five uh, most important policy issues. And you can see those two have a, a large margin over the others. Um, and again, we have so many other different topics that are related to political engagement. And uh, one of the beauties of this survey was that we weren't just looking to get information, but we have recommendations that were based off of that. So when it comes to political engagement, um, it reveals how we're going to engage the sick American um, community in these conversations, uh, what topics are the ones that are of interest, and helping people realize how engaged the sick American community really is. Um, so next, can we, I'm gonna go over just a couple more topics. Can we go to page 28 and 29? So we have a whole bunch of information on political engagement, but we also, want to build off of the turban myths uh, study that we did a few years ago. And we have a section on use and perception of the news. And as you can see here, that only 3.8% of respondents felt that American news organizations were very accurate in their coverage of sick and sickism, while 40.1% uh, had a feeling uh, that coverage was very or somewhat inaccurate. Uh, again, it puts in perspective the work that we need to do, and we can develop recommendations based off of this. Um, that we need to hold news organizations to a higher standard when discussing uh, journalism and provides direction for advocacy organizations and the sick community as a whole moving forward. Um, and then lastly, can we move to page 32 and 33? Um, one of the biggest things that we want to address was discrimination. And uh, as you can see here, 58% of respondents indicated that they have been bullied or harassed because of their sick identity. Uh, and you can also see that respondents living in the West, Western region had higher rates of bullying and harassment at 60%. Um, you can also see that 63% of respondents who wear turbans indicated that they have been discriminated against for wearing one. And in the South, those numbers jumped to 70%. Um, this also provides us with regional um, data so that we can see that we can address certain issues in particular areas. Uh, and again, this, all this data is going into a, um, recommendations that we can address to help better serve the sick community. Um, we have a whole bunch of other data that, and we're happy to take questions from you um, at the end. Um, again, we have survey results uh, that I think are revolutionary and can bring us into the next phase of advocacy for the sick American community. And we also have recommendations that are based off of all of these. Uh, with that, I would like to introduce uh, Monica Dingra, who is the state senator for the 45th Legislative District in Washington State. We're excited to have her join us today and hear her perspective on this landmark study. Thank you. Hello. Um, thank you so much um, for uh, including me in this historic moment. My name is Monica Dingra. I'm the Deputy Majority Leader of the Washington State Senate. In 2017, I was the first sick ever elected to a state legislature in the United States. Let me first say thank you to SALDEF for the work they're doing and have been doing in the sick community. Real change comes from the communities. And that means that we as elected leaders have to listen to people about what their community needs are. In addition to having conversations with people, it's vital that we have numbers to give us the big picture. For too long, data has been missing for sick communities in America. This survey is a wonderful step towards filling that gap. Personal stories are very important, but the combination of data along with those experiences is what drives policy. Two numbers immediately jumped out to me from the results. First, that 93% of adult citizen respondents reported that they were registered to vote. That's an incredible rate. 
and an incredible commitment to civic participation. The average across all groups is only about 65%. So six are far ahead in voter registration. But the second number is not so reassuring. Only 6% of respondents felt that elected officials are always listening to the needs of certain Americans. That reflects an alienation from a political system that is troubling to me, but it is one that I can certainly understand. When I decided to run for office, there were concerns about how my family would be perceived by voters. We know all too well how men wearing turbans, like my husband, can be treated in American society. In fact, the survey shows that 63% of respondents who wear turbans have experienced discrimination. And I have seen that firsthand with my grandfather, brother, and cousins while growing up in California. So it was crucial for me during my campaign to make sure that our entire family was proudly displayed. While we didn't get some racial attacks featuring my husband, we were overwhelmed by support and acceptance from our broader communities. And that's one of the great lessons that we can draw from this survey. Discrimination and harassment are real, but we can work together to transcend them. We can work together through the political process, as well as in our communities and our schools to educate our neighbors and raise awareness. I know that many parents like me have spent a lot of time in our elementary schools teaching classes about Sikhism. As a fifth largest religion in the world, that is based in prom promoting equality among all people, humility, and service to others, and has been a part of the United States for over a century, we have to create a curriculum that includes Sikh history in our schools. Sikh Americans are engaged and enthusiastic. What we need are channels for that energy. I was heartened to see that one of the most important policy issues for Sikh Americans is racial justice. I was a senior deputy prosecuting attorney for 18 years before I ran for the Senate. And I got involved in hate crimes after 9-11 when a local Seattle sick cab driver was assaulted. I have conducted the Saldas cultural awareness training for law enforcement officers in King County. And I've seen firsthand the results that acknowledgement, awareness, and education can bring. The survey reveals that equality is not only one of the barriers facing sick Americans, but also one of the areas that we're most passionate about. Representation matters. To get our issues on the table, we need people sitting at the table. And this survey is a great call to action. It is only thanks to the tireless work of groups like Zelda, which put the important issues in perspective, that we have the collective will inside the legislature to make progress on those issues. I look forward to working together towards meaningful change and more meaningful engagement. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manka. Um, Senator Dingra, I, I should say rather, <laughs> we, we thank you for the work that you've done and um, for the advocacy that you do on, on behalf of all your constituents and also for sick Americans. Um, you know, again, I, I do want to thank all community members for taking the survey. We absolutely could not have done this without your support. Uh, I think Senator Dingra summarized it very well. You know, the survey captures the Sikh American experience, experiences that we all know and we're familiar with, but having the quantifiable quantifiable data behind that um, allows policymakers, um, you know, such as Senator Dingra and others to really move forward and, and push for issues that, uh, that we know happen in our communities, such as uh, discrimination, um, you know, hate crimes and the like. Um, I also do wanna point out, and I think, um, I think our speakers did um, mention this as well, some of the top five issues um, included issues that are fundamental to, to the Sikh philosophy, social justice and equality, um, are issues that are, are deeply important in Sikhism. And we look to advance that not only for Sikhs, but also for the larger community. So that is something certainly, you know, at SALDEF we will take a look at. I think we are um, certainly in a critical time. As I mentioned, SALDEF is coming up in a, uh, our 25th anniversary uh, coming up next year. So it is a key time for us to really look um, at the issues that are of importance to the community so we can develop our strategic programming and make sure that those issues are addressed and the community needs are met. 
Um, in addition, you know, this, this survey is critical for policymakers, uh, for government agencies to secure grants and resources for the communities, um, and also for other sick orgs, for us to really tell the community story. Um, so again, I wanna thank all of you for being here today, and I will, um, I guess, open it up for questions. Hi, everyone. Um, please feel free to type your questions into the chat. Um, you can also, if you have any questions, um, raise your hand and I can unmute you and you would be able to ask. All right. Hi, Gertrude. Uh, this is Amin. Um, I know we have uh, one question there I'd like to answer. The question is, uh, has there been a survey of Canadians done? Uh, and it's something that we can compare uh, our survey too. Uh, I'd like to answer that by saying that in Canada, there's a significantly larger sick population and they actually have um, the number of sick tracked in their census. Uh, and since they have it within the census, they're able to do data extracts and do a lot more information off of that. Uh, since we are not tracked within the current U.S. Census, having the sick survey is of even more importance because it creates a baseline for us to start the, that the research that we need to move forward as a community, uh, as well as in, as advocacy organizations. So in Canada, they are a bit um, further along because they do track the number of six within the census itself. All right, so we have quite a few questions coming in. Um, so one of the questions, and I'll pose this to Kieran and Amin, um, what is the next project and Cognit as well? If any of you want to take that. Sure, I, I can um, start with that. In terms of projects, it's all that we're always doing a lot of projects and I can leave that to uh, Karen. But in terms of the, the survey, uh, this is just the beginning uh, and not just the, not the end. Uh, we want to continue the survey. We have a lot of things that we have determined that we want to move on. There's other topics that we want to survey the, the community on. Uh, we want to expand this to other languages, including Punjabi, in future years, so that we uh, cannot just get the English-speaking um, Sikh community, but address all of the Sikh community here in the U.S. Um, and then there's always going to be extra topics that we can address. Um, some of the limitations that we do have is that uh, the longer your survey gets, the less attention you have. But by breaking it up and doing it uh, year over year, we're able to focus on particular topics and bring back constructive and thorough information each year. Um, so Kieran, I'll send this question to you. Um, who will have access to this data and how? Well, the survey is on our website, so um, anyone can uh, have access to the survey there. Um, it's available to the community, it's available to policymakers, um, it's, it'll be available to um, as I mentioned, researchers, the like. So um, we really want to make this open for everybody. This information is there to be shared and to be uh, built upon, you know, in terms of other uh, research and um, supporting other efforts for the community. All right. Um, we have a question from Harleen. Um, I mean, quickly, it's a long question. How many respondents were there? And, and I'm going to pose this to you, Kavneet. How many respondents were there? And are you all continuing to collect responses? What were the ways that the survey was dispersed? And do you have a sense that it, if there are aspects of the community who are not represented? Yeah, thank you, Kadri. Um, Harleen, good question. Um, <clears throat> so are we collecting responses? No, now, no, we, we stopped that process. Um, the total number of respondents was when we began or when we started the analysis, it was over 2000. The total compiled though in the results were 1861. Um, so the, what were the ways the survey was di dispersed? Obviously because of COVID, uh, things were a little different. So we relied a lot on social media, WhatsApp groups, email and word of mouth. Uh, regrettably, I think we had a plan to also engage at the Gurdwara level to be able to get folks who are maybe not online or not connected to SALDEF or um, don't have language access. So to the last part of your question, are there aspects of the community who are not represented? I think very clearly this is not a comprehensive 
survey of the community. Um, we, if you look, looking at the demographics, you can see, hey, we, we definitely have folks who are non-English speakers, maybe in certain geographies, maybe certain demographics as well. Um, folks who are, for example, blue collar, maybe who are truck drivers who have more uh, roles where they are not in a permanent workplace, perhaps we've missed them. So I think absolutely there is, there is room for us to continue, as Amun said, expand the work, expand the reach to get a more, um, a fuller perspective of the community. And I would just add to that, it is SOLIDEF's goal to, to do this survey, um, you know, on a um, either annual, bi biannual basis, so, or uh, every annually or every other year, just to continue to get that feedback um, from the community, because I think that is really important. And we want to make sure that we are, you know, in front of the issues and that we understand that for all the reasons that I mentioned previously. Great. So I'm going to just um, unmute you, just cheat, and see if this works and if you can ask your question. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Well, I'm driving, so I hope I don't drop the call on I-95. Um, so uh, this is uh, Jatjit Alawalia. Uh, hi, Amen. Hi, uh, Tavi and uh, Garen. <laughs> good to see you guys. This is great. Uh, I participate in the survey, and I think, you know, as an academic physician scientist, anytime there's data, uh, that means we've got knowledge and we can do something about it. Uh, as our senator said, that, you know, without data, you really can't do anything. And the data is, of course, no surprise, extremely uh, disturbing. Uh, as someone who wears the turban, I'm, I'm well aware of this. Um, so, you know, one of the things to think about, I, I love the question when someone asks, what's the next project? Um, and I, you know, I've got that. And in fact, before someone asked that, I want to set up a call uh, with you, uh, Kavi and uh, and uh, Aman and, and Karen to talk about it. Which is, uh, you know, so I'm I'm obviously in health and health, and uh, my area of work is in disparities and discrimination, stress. So if you think about this data, obviously it has ramifications with regards to the political process, uh, all that kind of stuff, and 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 and, and bullying. But the net result then becomes actually health, believe it or not. Or not, or not. There's PTSD, there's depression, there's anxiety, um, and the list goes on. And then that has sort of a spillover effect to hypertension, the horrible diabetes that occurs in our community, and so on and so forth. So I'd like us to uh, think about that. If you uh, email me, maybe you can set up a call, a four-way call, but maybe one of you can respond to that as that come up, and, 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 and so on and so forth. Uh, because, you know, no one's really doing that kind of work in the U.S., um, unfortunately, not even me. Uh, my area of work is with African Americans, but I would love to get some more work on this and then eventually use this pilot data uh, to secure NIH funding. Thank you for letting me speak. All right, thanks. I, I'll just respond to that. I think just, Jeet, you, you brought up a great point. Um, and I think there's a lot of applications for the survey data. That certainly is one of them. And I'd love to follow up with you and discuss that um, in further detail about how we um, might be able to address that issue. Thank you. All right, so we have a question for Senator Dingra. Um, what future steps can we take to further the hate crime laws that are currently on the books? Um, thank you so much for that question. You know, as I mentioned, being a senior deputy prosecuting attorney, I've worked in uh, the hate crime arena. And, you know, I um, use the Saldes Law Enforcement uh, Cultural Awareness Training way back early in the days. Um, and use at the prosecutor's office as well as uh, local law enforcement. And creating that awareness is, is critical. And it's also the manner in which we report, uh, report hate crimes. I think there's a huge underreporting in our community because our understanding of what constitutes a hate crime is, um, is different, right? People um, think only if you're assaulted or physically or hit is when you report it. And even then, then there's reluctance to do so. I think it's really important to create that awareness at any time you are in a situation where you feel unsafe or feel threatened, regardless of physical force being exerted on you, it is imperative that we call the local law enforcement and report it. 
uh, doesn't mean that you have to have an arrest necessarily. Um, it may mean that there is really no investigation, but having that voice, having that incident reported is very critical. And this is where I think that data combination with the stories is very helpful. You know, um, I grew up with my brothers and my cousins telling me stories of what happened at school and what people would say. No one ever thought to report those incidents. Um, I agree, that was 30 years ago, but those are incidents that need to be reported and should be reported. You know, I have stories of my grandfather uh, driving down the street and at a stoplight and someone yelling at him, um, you know, about his turban and things like that. And, you know, he just came home and he was upset. Today, you call and you report it because behavior like that is unacceptable. And so when we feel that discrimination, when we feel that um, hate, it has to be reported and captured. And once you have that data again, that is when you know that people will start paying attention. And that is why the survey is so critical is because you need that combination of personal experiences along with that data reporting. And hopefully now people can understand why we have to make sure we are reporting hate crimes. And once we have that data captured at the local level, we can really make sure that we're taking action around it. Great, and that actually kind of follows us into our next question. Um, so this I, I'll pose to Amen Kiran Kavneet. Um, are we gonna start looking to develop data on sexual abuse within our community and um, create kind of spaces for Me Too movements? Sure, I'll take the first part of that and uh, I can pass it on to uh, Kavneet and Kiran for the second part. Um, in terms of the survey itself, we did look into um, questions regarding sexual abuse, uh, but we did decide to pass on that for this round because we want to partner with organizations that focus primarily on sexual abuse to make sure that we are protecting the rights of victims and not triggering uh, any unwanted um, PTSD and other emotional stress that um, was stated by Justith actually earlier. Um, so it is something that we are looking to do, but we want to make sure that we're doing it responsibly and correctly that we are, so that we have the victims in mind rather than uh, solely looking for data collection. And I'll just, um, I'll, I'll just sort of piggyback on that. Um, so that I guess the answer is yes, that is an area that we um, will be looking into. Um, we did, you know, for the top five um, issues of most importance to the community, um, two of them were gender equity and domestic violence. As Amun said, we didn't specifically address sexual abuse um, in this survey, but that is um, an area that we do have planned to address in um, future surveys. So um, that will be something that, um, you know, we will be addressing at, I think, the next round. And Gujar, if I may uh, just add, I'm actually one of the founders of Chaya, which is a South Asian domestic violence organization that I helped found about 25 years ago. And so there is a lot of work being done in our communities all over the country, uh, to uh, Amon's point, that we have groups that are working with survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, or trafficking. Um, and that's also work that I do in the legislature. So I think partnering with groups that are already working with survivors is going to be key in making sure we uh, do this in a way that is most respectful and safe for everyone involved. Great, so we have another great question. Um, looking at the report, will SALDEF team with other, organiza will, with other organizations uh, work to develop training videos for communities, specifically cultural sensitivity for local city councils or police? I'll let any of you guys take this question. Kieran, I'll send it to you. Yeah, I, I'm happy to, to jump in. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> go, go ahead, go yeah, I'm happy to jump in. I think South has a long history of being really a pioneer in law enforcement and civic uh, trainings across the country. And so I think as opportunities arise, absolutely. We're already beginning to look at how do we engage first responders more? Uh, we focused on law enforcement, security personnel, um, airport screeners for the last almost two decades. And now looking at where else do we see the opportunity that individuals have direct interaction with the sick American community, but don't necessarily understand why we do certain things or why we look certain ways. And, and so first responders are, are definitely near the top of that list. I think also we're seeing 
in-home care and um, extended care facilities where individuals who may be ill may be having long long-term rehabilitation needs and then have something that's happened to them while they're sick or while they're even asleep that is against the protocol of their faith and, and so absolutely to the question mark thank you um, I think that's absolutely something we want to do and continue to do and I'd like to add on to that um, I know for years we've been working with so many partners, including the Department of Justice, the FBI, Homeland Security, to develop a lot of these trainings for the police. And in terms of the local city councils, uh, we did a study called Turban Myths um, a few years back, which we've used as a platform for creating these presentations for city councils, as well as other public groups. I think having the survey now uh, just allows us to have more data and refine those presentations with current updated and more specific data that really addresses the issues. So we are absolutely gonna be transforming this into presentations that we use for city councils as well as other public entities. Okay, I also wanna remind everyone that they can raise their hand if they wanna ask their question um, in person. Uh, we have one, um, which um, and I think I'll give this to you. What is the age distribution from the survey? Sure, so uh, our survey captured people who are age 13 and up. Uh, we did have respondents below that, but we took them out of the pool. Um, our distribution was relatively pretty even. Um, we broke it up into seven different groups, starting from age 13 to 17, so we can capture that uh, primary school population. That was right around 9% of our respond respondent pool. Uh, and then we had a group from 18 to 24, 25 to 34, 35 to 44 and 45 to 54, which were all uh, between 15 to 20% of our respondent pool. And then uh, the last two upper um, limits, which are 55 to 64 and 65 and up were both over 10%. So we had a pretty good age distribution. Um, so we're able to capture from different generations uh, within, this, um, within our data pool. Hi, so we have a long question from Mandeep. I'm gonna sh um, shorten it up a little bit, and this is for you, Senator Dingra. In the continued uptick of hate crimes, um, how do we as a community come together, I mean, and even begin to address these? So in the report, it also, um, we can talk, I mean, there are different parts where it does say that people are feeling um, discriminated against, or they're feeling, especially in the South, that they don't feel always like they have the right to or they feel comfortable um, ex having their sickie and wearing their sickie. So um, how do we as a community come together and even begin to address these? And it's, I'll continue his question. It seems to me like these hate crimes are seen as the specific area problems and not the sick community problems. This, uh, you know, we could have a whole hour to uh, discuss this question. Um, and so, you know, there's a whole difference in reporting, investigation, sending it for prosecution, filing of the charge, and then going through the criminal justice process. And uh, a lot of that, um, I think there's struggles there for a lot of different communities, and uh, not just with the sick community. So I think there is some similarities there. What I think is very important for us to do is actually a lot of what is already being discussed is create those relationships with law enforcement, create those relationships with our elected officials create those relationships with prosecuting attorney's offices. You know, after 9-11, um, here in Seattle, uh, the Seattle Police Department created advisory groups. So I was a part of the uh, Muslim Sikh, Sikh Arab um, advisory group for a very long time. And while that was a place where community can come along with law enforcement, so we had representation from the prosecutor's office, from law enforcement, from the FBI, US Attorney's Office, and it really was a way uh, to get updates on information, to talk about barriers, and to create that, that trust. Um, we've created a situation now where our law enforcement has relationship with the Gudwaras. They actually will just go in and stop for longer. They understand the traditions, um, and they also understand that sometimes during elections, there may be a squaffle that has happened in the Gudwaras in our area, but it is an understanding of what that means and the context around it instead of getting 
a 911 call and showing up and not knowing what's going on. So uh, while we absolutely have to do work in our criminal justice system, there's a lot of work that can be done in building those relationships, in building those trusts, and having those conversations that are really important. And so I'm really hoping that organizations like Salvac or local Gutvaras will actually take the time to start engaging with the community in a different way. And I've seen um, that happen already over and over again. Um, you know, recently we had, actually before COVID, we had the big Gutvara in Vancouver, Washington have its opening. And it wasn't just an opening that was done for um, six, right, or Indians. It was an entire community opening. We got the governor in, I was there, and the entire neighborhood was there, regardless of um, the color of their skin or their religious um, preference, because it was about the community coming together. So I think this is a real opportunity for us not to just uh, work in the criminal justice realm, but to work on these larger issues and let people in and create those relationships that I think are very important and do end up impacting our access to criminal justice. Great, and we have a question. Um, so Raj, I'm going to allow you, um, unmute you if you're ready. Hi there. Um, I just I kind of wanted to build off of something that the Senator um, said. Thank you for being on the call, by the way. It's uh, to everyone, this is amazing. Um, but uh, I'm currently calling in from Sacramento and something the Senator brought up was like these scuffles. <laughs> which is like a light word for sometimes what happens at the Gord Guadas. Um, but I, I think this, what the work that we're doing is so vital to the, uh, to the health of the Gord Guadas. So what, um, this is more maybe like a broader question, like how can we um, engage youth that have, um, you know, become apathetic to Gord Guada politics that are so crucial to the health of the community? And maybe like, how can we use these findings um, to do that, to reintroduce the youth back into um, the political world of Gordwadas? I'm happy to start that answer on that one. And uh, Aaron, you me, feel free to chime in uh, however you like. I think uh, as an organization of SALDA, part of what we wanna do is to increase that political engagement uh, I think that we see uh, a lot of that political engagement. Um, you see it in the survey itself, that the number of people are very engaged and even the youth is very engaged. Uh, I know that we have a bunch of projects and programs that we're working on from law enforcement policy programs, as well as Know Your Rights forms that combine the, the knowledge that we have and then work with the local Sangats and local Gudwadas so that they can become more engaged. And I think as the good waters become more engaged, they will start to draw in the youth because they realize that they can make a difference in their community. They can change um, and have an actual impact in the way that six are perceived. Uh, and as we make those connections and allow the local Sangats to have the connections with the FBI, with Homeland Security, with their local police departments, we will start to bring in the youth. And a lot of our other programming, including our sick leave program is directly focused on sick youth and we go through an entire training series uh, both through our internship program as well as our leadership development program which focuses on political engagement being involved making sure that your community your local community your good water are involved in politics um, so that we can make a difference and have our voice the strongest yeah and i i would to, to Amon's point i would add i think the the role of the gurdwara has has morphed in the history of our community. And I think if we look back a generation, we see it really as this solely as a religious center and social um, connectivity point. And I think you're seeing now the, and that was necessary as we saw post 1965, the immigration of our parents, our grandparents to this country, they needed that place together. I think what you're seeing now is the ability of the Gurdwara to really fulfill its true role. It's not just a religious center, but it's a social center and it's a political center. And how do we begin to use the Gurdwara as that place, as the center of activism and engagement for the community? So whether it's senior centers, whether it's language programs for newly, new immigrants, uh, whether it's 
hosting political forums so that our local elected officials have to speak to our issues. I think that's the, the critical role of the Burbora and how we can um, begin to use it as uh, the powerful entity that it is. So Grudge, thank you for your question. And if I can just piggyback on that, um, and uh, Kavit, it's a great point. I, you know, I have seen in my lifetime Gurdwaras more from the time when I used to go to, with my Dadaji and uh, Dadiji um, to the Gurdwaras in Lancashire, California, to now the ones that I see in Washington. I mean, we have the Khalsa Gurmat Center here, which has robotics classes and programming classes, as well as teaching Gurmukhi. And, you know, when you're talking about engaging the youth, um, and I think this is what the survey is really interesting to take a look at the educational background um, as well of uh, Sikhism or the uh, Sikh people is that they they have a wide variety of experiences and let's make sure we're incorporating all of it in Gudvara. Um, so the fact that they have a robotics class and a programming class along with Gurmukhi I think is fantastic. And on Khalsa Day, um, our event in Gudvaras, Every elected official in the area is there speaking, also because they want longer, but, um, you know, and over and over again, you know, I take my campaign team to Gudwaras, and they're like, really? Like, you don't have to pay for any of the food? And I'm like, no, you don't. And, you know, that awareness and just um, is huge. And the manner in which Sikh Americans, well, actually, Sikhs all over the world have stepped up during COVID has just been fantastic to see. And I think that... Um, experience and and what's in the news around what six are doing all over the world along with the survey I think really can tell a very compelling story of what it means to be a sick American so we have um, one final question uh, and I'll open this up to everyone um, once the census data is out do you feel it might be important to compare the data our data with the census data? I, I can start off and then I would love to hear from uh, Amun since he's so involved and then Senator Dingra being a, um, a politico. Uh, but, but I think the answer to that is yes and no. Right, yes, absolutely. Can we compare it to certain metrics that are in the census, of course. But the data that is in this survey is a wide ranging set of questions that the census will not be talking about. And so absolutely, can we use it? I think of it as a, another tool in our toolbox to tell the story and to advance the, the needs of the community. Sure, and I'll, I'll build off that. And, and again, it's, as Gavneet said, um, the census is looking at a lot of the demographic information. But here, we're specifically targeting the Sikh American community. Uh, and I think that we're addressing issues that people want to get addressed and we're getting feedback about issues that people want to get addressed the next time we do a survey. Uh, I think we can tailor it. Um, there's ways to link it to the, our census data, but um, we'll look at those tools to expand the information that we do have. But I, I think the survey uh, on, on its own uh, just provides tremendous value. And, you know, I'll just say, um, I agree, I think the survey in of itself is um, really crucial because when you just look at just um, um, the census data throughout, like, you know, am I Asian? Am I Indian? Um, you know, how do I define myself, right? When people say, where are you from? Which I get asked a lot. I actually have a very hard time with that question, right? My grandparents, all four sets, were born in what is now Pakistan, right? They were all from Lahore, but, Am I Indian? Am I Indian American? Um, so it, it's very confusing when you just have a survey, um, I mean the census, because they're not really able to uh, tell the full story of what it means to be a Sikh American. I think this is why this survey is so crucial, is because it paints that bigger picture. It's not just about numbers. It is what is the meaning behind those numbers? What do those numbers mean? Um, I think that is what's really important. I mean, both are important. Hopefully everyone did this, the census. Um, but I think this really gets to what is behind the numbers. All right, are there any, anyone have any final comments before we wrap up? Um, well, this, 
the survey is now available. All the data is available on our website, www.saldef.org. Um, so please go there and visit it. If you have any additional questions, um, feel free to email media at saldef.org, media, M-E-D-I-A, at saldef.org. Um, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, and special thank you to Senator Dingra for joining us. That was really special. And it really, I think, made this a very enjoyable and exciting event. Um, thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Always a pleasure to be here. Thank you all.